Who's putting pressure on the planet? One of humanity's greatest challenges in the 21st century is to ensure that every person has the resources they need to meet their human rights, such as to food and water, to health and energy, so that they can rise above a social foundation, and simultaneously to ensure that our collective pressure on natural resources remains within the means of this one planet, by staying within the environmental ceiling of planetary boundaries. In other words, we need to get into the donut, that safe and just space which lies between social and planetary boundaries. And it's no easy task because the current path of development has put us outside those boundaries on both sides. Many millions of people still live far below that social foundation, deprived of the rights and resources they need to lead dignified and fulfilling lives. And at the same time, humanity's collective pressure on natural resources is veering towards tipping points with at least three planetary boundaries believed to have been breached for climate change, nitrogen pollution and biodiversity loss, and with stress on many other boundaries rising fast. So who's putting this planet under such pressure? The biggest source of planetary boundary stress today is the excessive resource consumption by roughly the richest 10% of people across the world. That stress is exacerbated both by a growing global middle class seeking to emulate their unsustainable lifestyles and by huge inefficiencies in every region in how resources are used. This video explores the data behind four planetary boundaries to find out just where that pressure is coming from. Take nitrogen pollution for starters. Humanity's use of reactive nitrogen is more than three times over its estimated planetary boundary. So what's brought us here? Let's be clear, reactive nitrogen is essential for human survival. It's key to soil fertility and we consume it in the meat and vegetables that we eat. But when too much of it gets released into the environment through excessive fertilizer use, sewage systems and fossil fuels, it degrades the air and water in ways that severely harm us. Reactive nitrogen helps create the hole in the ozone layer, leading to increased skin cancers. When it ends up in rivers, lakes or the sea, it can create algal blooms that kill fish and break down the food chain. Reactive nitrogen in the air helps create smog that causes lung disease. Global use of reactive nitrogen has risen fast. Its use in chemical fertilisers alone has risen more than tenfold since 1960. But behind this global total lie vast differences in its use within and between countries. The red areas in this map show global hotspots of the intense use of nitrogen fertilizers in agriculture, causing severe nitrogen pollution in those regions. There's a dead zone the size of Massachusetts in the Gulf of Mexico due to runoff from America's agricultural heartlands. Likewise, nitrate runoff in Europe has created dead zones in the North Sea, the Adriatic and the Baltic Sea. Per capita nitrogen footprints vary widely. The average US footprint is three and a half times that of Tanzania. But even among high income countries, there are big differences. Compare America's 41 kilos per person per year to the Netherlands' 25. What explains that difference? In the Netherlands, government policies have raised the efficiency of both fertilizer use and sewage systems, and people tend to eat less in total and less meat in particular. Indeed, cutting meat consumption is one of the fastest routes to cutting nitrogen pollution. According to the US National Health and Nutrition Survey, Americans consume two and a half times as much protein as they need to from meat consumption alone. If they ate just the recommended amount of protein, their nitrogen footprints would fall by more than 40%. Likewise, if people in Europe got all their protein from plants instead of meat, less than one third of crops currently grown for the EU would be needed, reducing Europe's nitrogen fertilizer pollution by 70%. So changing consumption choices can clearly change nitrogen footprints. What about pressure on the world's fresh water sources? Globally, fresh water use is still below the estimated planetary boundary, but many countries and regions already face severe water stress, shown in this map by the orange and red areas of water scarcity, covering parts of Central America, North and Southern Africa, and much of the Middle East and Asia. Fresh water is essential for life. The vast majority of it is used for agriculture, the rest in industry and households. But the stress of excessive water withdrawals can be devastating. It can literally dry up major water bodies like the Aral Sea. It can kill off aquatic life and devastate local people's livelihoods and health. Global water withdrawals have trebled since 1950 and global water demand is expected to rise a further 30% by 2030. But behind this global total, national water footprints vary widely in their size and in their reliance on water imports. China's water footprint is around 1,000 cubic metres per person per year. The UK's is around 20% higher than that but where just 7% of China's water use is imported from other countries. In the UK, a staggering 66% of water consumed is imported, mainly embedded in agricultural products. And as this graphic shows, 
Some of it comes from countries facing water stress or countries which are home to millions of people living with water poverty. There are wide inequalities of water use within countries too. In many low-income countries, most of the richest 20% of people get water from taps, but the poorest 20% still draw their water from wells and rivers or buy it from trucks, paying more for it as a result, depriving them of both the quality and quantity of water that they need. As fresh water use clearly shows, income inequalities within and between countries lead to extreme resource use inequalities too. The challenge of global greenhouse gas emissions is the most widely known of the planetary boundary crises. The safe boundary has already been breached with people across the world experiencing the consequences. Industry, energy, transport and agriculture are the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions and the resulting climate change is creating more frequent and severe floods and droughts and greater seasonal uncertainty with devastating impacts on people's lives and livelihoods. Global carbon emissions have more than trebled since 1960, but there are, of course, big differences in carbon footprints between countries, as this map shows. The average Qatari produces the same greenhouse gas emissions as three Americans, or 11 Mexicans, or 80 Ghanaians. Even these extraordinary national differences mask carbon inequalities within countries, as diverse as China, the UK and Sweden, as these data show. In the UK, the richest 10% of people have twice the carbon emissions of the poorest 10%. In Sweden, it's four times as much. In China, 18 times as much. These carbon inequalities within countries, on top of carbon inequalities between countries, highlight that it is a small elite across the world, call them the global carbonistas, who produce the bulk of emissions. Indeed, it's estimated that around half of the world's CO2 emissions are produced by just 11% of the global population. So in tackling climate change, it's clear that the emissions of the world's wealthiest people, not the poorest, are the ones that need to be addressed. Lastly, what about land use change? Humanity has been transforming landscapes for many thousands of years to harvest timber, to grow food and to live upon. But severe changes in land use result in degradation, biodiversity loss and desertification, putting the land out of use. The area of the planet's land converted for human use has nearly doubled in the last 50 years, with almost 2 billion hectares becoming degraded since 1950. National land use footprints vary widely. China's per capita footprint is one-fifth of America's, and America's is one-sixth of Australia's. What's behind the differences? In part, differing types and qualities of land, but also different consumer lifestyles put very different demands on the land. On top of the pressures of land degradation, the ownership of the world's agricultural land is getting more concentrated as global investors buy up land across the developing world, shown in this map. Over the past decade, an area of land nearly eight times the size of the UK has been sold off worldwide. And too often, land said to be unused or underdeveloped has been grabbed for those investors by kicking farming families off their land, so losing their crops and water, homes and communities and livelihoods overnight. The world's land use has long been dominated by the footprints of high-income consumers. Now it is also getting concentrated in the hands of high-income investors, doubly exacerbating this resource inequality. So let's pull back to the big picture. From nitrogen and freshwater use to greenhouse gases and land use change, regional and global resources are under stress. And each of these exacerbates the crisis of biodiversity loss too. The excessive pressure on these planetary boundaries is being driven by the consumption patterns and choices of the world's most affluent consumers and the inefficient production patterns of the companies that produce goods for them. That pressure is being redoubled by the growing global middle class aiming to emulate their lifestyles. The challenge is clear, to reduce and redistribute the use of the planet's resources in order to meet the human rights of everyone while staying within safe limits of what the Earth can sustainably provide. This calls for a transformation in consumption and production patterns and it calls for putting human rights and planetary boundaries at the heart of economic development so that collectively we can create a safe and just space for humanity.